It's a great honor to have Professor Jacob Hacker with us today. Um, he's a specialist in healthcare and uh, a bunch of other areas, which we'll hear about. Um, today, he will be discussing his uh, research results that's published in a recent book called Let Them Eat Tweets. I don't know if you can see that. Anyway, it, that's the low-tech form. The high-tech form is a link that's pasted into the invitation that you re received for today's program. And you can go to either an independent bookseller or to Amazon um, as you like. But uh, if you're, if you're uh, enticed by today's um, presentation, go get the book. So his presentation, his talk today, is called The Crisis of American Democracy, Plutocrats, Populists, and the Republican Party. So Professor Hacker, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to your presentation. Great, thank you so much, Dan. I'm gonna share my screen so you can see uh, what I, you can see what my slides, hold on a second. All right, so I've given a fair number of talks using Zoom, and I would say the thing I like least about it is the lack of, uh, of real-time interaction with folks, because once you start making, doing your talk, everyone kind of disappears into the background. But I've actually gotten relatively good um, at, um, at responding to questions as I speak. So feel free to write them in the Q&A, and, and if they're clarifying questions or relatively easy to weave into the talk, um, I can't promise that I'll be able to uh, do it, but I'll try to, to uh, respond. Um, as Dan said, I'm a political scientist at Yale, and this is my, uh, based on my latest book, the picture of which is here, that um, is written with Paul Pearson. Um, I really should thank Paul, uh, because in a lot of ways, um, uh, all the good ideas in this book are his. Um, and, uh, and I, one of the things I've, I love about working with Paul is that um, the two of us are very simpatico, um, but we actually have very uh, sort of different skill sets. And so we, we end up working well together. And uh, it wasn't until after we'd started working together for probably been about a uh, half decade of working together before we discovered that we uh, were so simpatico because in part, I think, because we both grew up in a small college town in Oregon, uh, Eugene, uh, where our dads uh, were each professors um, at, in different fields and at, at somewhat different times. Um, and so that was quite a, that was quite a discovery. Um, so there was a kind of separated at birth kind of uh, feel to it. So uh, book authors um, tell this sort of uh, dark joke that the period before a book comes out is to calm before the calm. Uh, because so often after you get a, a book out, no one really pays attention. Um, and, uh, but this has been anything but a calm period. Um, uh, the book came out a few months ago and it's been, as you know, crazy. Um, it seems like years ago that it came out. Um, and it's also, the book has actually received an enormous amount of attention, um, far more than we could have expected, and, uh, and we're really gratified by that. And I think part of the reason um, that it's received a lot of attention is that um, it feels like the forces that we describe in the book have kind of come together in the most intense way uh, as we've grappled with this terrible crisis, uh, multiple crises that we're facing as a nation. So I wanna, I wanna start because the title of the book sort of suggests a certain read of it. Um, that this isn't a, that the first line of our book is that this is not a book about Donald Trump. Um, uh, he is in a lot of ways a kind of late entrant into our story. He's as, as much a product as a producer of the forces we describe. Um, and the reason we say that up front isn't because we don't say we don't want to explain Donald Trump. We, we think there's a lot of explaining to do, but because we think that there's two ways in which we've been really distracted. Um, and the tweets that we that, that are in the title are kind of a metaphor for that distraction. One is that we're distracted by the kind of intense um, the intense their daily 
uh, kind of polarized rhetoric of the Trump presidency and of the last you know, quarter century of our politics increasingly intense. And I think we're also distracted because we've tended to see Trump um, as a kind of a break with what the Republican Party was before. Um, you know, we have a chapter in the, um, in the book uh, that's entitled A Very Civil War, um, which is sort of giving us, giving you our sense of what this, this conflict within the party really is about. It actually turns out that there's uh, a lot of ways in which Trump is a, is an, is a kind of uh, uh, outgrowth of the extreme uh, development of the Republican Party. Um, and, uh, and he's by no means uh, uh, a kind of wholly new, cr new creation. So the basic argument, um, I have no idea how this got on my screen, this red line. Um, so uh, the basic uh, argument of our book is that the Republican Party under Trump has reached this kind of uh, hybrid that we call plutocratic populism. Um, and it's a kind of marriage of organized money and organized outrage, or as we put it in the book, a kind of bitter brew of reactionary economic priorities and, and right-wing racial and cultural appeals. And um, does anybody know why I'm getting these red lines? Do you guys see red lines on your screen? Yeah. I think there might be uh, somebody who has access to the screen that is drawing on my screen. I'm not sure how to get rid of that, but just so you know. Um, and if you are the person, um, and I think it was, uh, I did at one point see a little name attached to it, Levine. Um, so if you are the person, and I don't see that person uh, right now on the, uh, on the call, but if you are the person who has the, the ability to draw those lines, oh, wait, look, they, they went away, uh, great. Okay, so now that sorry for that break. So the um, the 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 first so so the basic argument I'm just going to kind of give away the argument now so I can um, draw out some of its implications before we get into the Q um, and A uh, and uh, and and uh, the basic argument of the book is that this kind of hybrid that the Republican Party has become is uh, combines this pretty well-known phenomenon of right-wing populism, right? Where sort of ethno-nationalist appeals, strong emphasis on anti-immigrant uh, backlash, uh, and so on, um, with, um, with a kind of commitment to backstopping the rich and powerful in the most unequal rich democracy in the world um, that we don't see in other rich countries. So it's a different kind of right-wing populism because it is precisely because it is so plutocratic. And it brings together not just uh, this strange marriage of kind of, um, you know, libertarian and um, nas white nationalist kind of themes, but it brings together these two sets of intense policy demanders, as you might call them. That is, uh, these groups that are really representing the super rich and corporations, uh, groups like the Cha U.S. Chamber of Commerce and uh, the Koch network of uh, big donors and organizations that are seeking really conservative economic policies. And these uh, groups that I will talk about later, I call them groups with troops. Um, and they're the kind of right-wing outrage generating groups, including the Christian right, the National Rifle Association, and right-wing media, which, um, which I'll argue is really important to the story. And while it's not really a group, um, plays a vital role in the story. Okay, so, and the, the kind of common denominator here is these are minoritarian uh, groups. That is, they're seeking ends that are not supported by a majority of Americans, not even by, uh, in some cases by a majority of Republican voters. And, um, and the, what's, what's binding them on policy is the, pluto the, the, the aims of the plutocracy, tax cuts for the rich, deregulation, uh, putting business friendly judges in the courts. And, and, and what's binding voters to this set of, um, <laughs> no worries, Karen. Um, and what's, um, Car Karen has, has fessed up that somehow she, she was doing this while getting access to the, to the presentation from her car. I'm just impressed that uh, there's so many people on and that 
Um, they're, and they're, people are using their iPhones to get on and all that. Um, so anyway, and what binds and what binds voters, white working class voters in particular, to this party because it's not delivering much in the way of benefits to them is this increasing emphasis on, on cultural and racial backlash. Uh, as we put it in the book, Republicans are using white identity to defend wealth inequality, and they're undermining democracy to uphold plutocracy. Um, and I really appreciate if you guys can, everyone can make sure they're, um, they're muted. Okay, so having given away the whole argument, um, let, me, um, let me unpack it. Um, and and the, the first thing I want to say is that, the, the, as I said, this is very distinctive cross-nationally. For all the talk about how the U.S. looks like uh, other countries with regard to the rise of right-wing populism, the Republican Party is very different because it is a it is historically a mainstream conservative party, like the Conservative Party in Britain, and uh, and yet it is close to these parties of the right, and sometimes even to the right of them when you start to look across countries. So this is one of those standard right-left divides. It was in the New York Times. Um, and it's based on campaign manifestos. And what you can see is the Democratic Party looks a lot like other um, center left parties. Um, it's maybe a bit more center than left in comparative perspective. That line is the median of all the party positions on the right left dimension. And the Republican Party is out there, you know, to the right of many of many conservative parties of all the conservative parties, but also close to some of these right wing uh, populist parties. Um, and I can, I'm happy to explain this. Now, um, Patricia asked about the Democrats and the fact that the Democrats are so close to the line is actually, I think, I'm getting feedback, so please make sure you're, you're muted, um, is actually, I think, a good illustration of the point that Patricia makes, which is the Democrats have been pulled, uh, have, even though they've become a more progressive party, I think, in recent years, um, at least certain parts of the party have become much more progressive. Um, they are pulled um, more to the center by money than the Republican Party, and, and we'll talk about that more in a moment. Okay, so let's just start with what I consider to be the most important point, which is that what the Republican Party has pursued in office prior to uh, the Trump presidency, but certainly under President Trump, is not that popular. So this shows you the major policy initiatives of the last quarter century. And the way this figure is set up is all the polls are shown, but those big circles in the figure, those are the average levels of support for these different pieces of legislation. And you can see the line uh, running right up the center here is 50%, right? And so you, you can see two things. One is that over time, average support for major initiatives has declined. That said, you know, the financial reform bill and uh, the recovery package were actually both pretty popular. Um, the Affordable Care Act, you can see here, is sort of in the 50-50 range. Um, but then these two things stand out, right? And these two things are the two major legislative uh, initiatives of Republicans uh, in the last four years. Um, they tried and barely failed to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, um, and they passed a tax reform bill. Um, now, the tax reform bill looks super unpopular because it's the least popular piece of legislation that's passed over the last 25 years, major piece of legislation, but it only, <laughs> it is only, the, the health care bill makes it look like it actually was, uh, you know, a really stunningly popular piece of legislation. So, the point is that politicians really aren't supposed to do stuff like this. Um, and, um, uh, you know, as we put it in the book, um, you know, trying to pass legislation that has like 25 to 30 percent support, it's, it's like, uh, for politicians, it's like, uh, it's like sort of unicorns. And so in 2017, Republicans conjured up two unicorns in a single year. And the, the, the question becomes why, right? So this is not obviously a path to party popularity. Um, and I just want to note the, the tax bill, right, was um, how skewed it was. 83% of its permanent benefits went to the top 1% of Americans in income distribution. It even, it's long, in the long term, it actually, as you can see, raised taxes for the poorest Americans. Um, and here's, for the average, for the richest 1%, the average uh, tax cut, annual tax cut was about $10,000 a year. 
Um, but most of that was going to the richest of the rich of the rich. And um, the, um, the, uh, the question becomes, well, if this, these are not very popular, if this is not a majoritarian strategy, well, who, who, who liked the tax cuts? Well, the Republicans were pretty frank about that. As, as the bill was endangered toward the end of 2017, they uh, summoned their courage and helped out their, and, and uh, made sure to, um, to do what their donors wanted. Um, so, and, and remember, this was not a small piece of legislation. It was $2 trillion unfunded um, uh, in tax cuts. Um, uh, and you should keep that in mind anytime um, you hear that we can't afford to spend a, a couple of million, a, a couple trillion dollars right now on saving uh, our economy um, for, amid the worst pandemic in our uh, in the last hundred years. Okay, so I don't want to belabor this point, but I think it's really important for political scientists, right? Um, there's a tendency to assume that elections and the sort of workings of democracy will assume will will create uh, responsiveness to the public, but that's just not what we see. And it raises two questions, right? It raises the question of, well, why do they, why are they so slavishly trying to do things that are not popular among their constituents even um, and for the and for the super rich? And also, how are they getting away with it, right? Or how have they gotten away with it? Um, so the first thing I just want to make sure we understand is this was not something where Republicans felt like, you know, this was a, you know, a mixed, a mixed record. For Republicans, 2017 in particular was, as Mitch McConnell said, the best year for conservatives in 30 years. And, and Mitch McConnell was not talking about uh, locking up, uh, you know, uh, immigrant children or, um, or, or the Trump trade wars, right? He was talking about the three things that um, he has pursued assiduously in office, um, uh, tax cuts for wealthy people, massive amounts of deregulation, consumer financial, environmental regulation, and uh, stacking the courts with highly conservative uh, judges and justices. Um, and uh, if, if Mitch was happy, Charles Koch was pretty happy too. Uh, he said that we've made more progress in the last five years than I've had in the previous 50, um, which I think he's dating it from the beginning of the Tea Party. So um, let, me, let me just leave it there and move on. But I just want you to understand, right, that there is, if this is a civil war, right, it's one in which the side that seems to be losing, the, the sort of business, conservative, economically conservative side, it, it's losing, but it's getting more than ever thought possible, right? So that's, uh, uh, it, we should all have such, um, such losses. Now, you may have seen a figure like this, but I think that the backdrop for what's happened to the Republican Party has to be the massive rise in inequality over the last generation. So you can see here the top half, uh, the top 1% of Americans have seen their share of income double, the bottom 50% uh, have seen their share of income fall by half uh, over the last 30, 35 years or so. And, and I just, as we think about what's distinctive about the, the United States, I just want to emphasize that this is not the pattern we see in Europe. Um, we've seen a little bit of a rise in inequality. And so we ask, in the book, we basically try to think about, well, what happens when you have extreme inequality? And we look across history and we find that whenever you have extreme inequality in a democracy, you have sort of three challenges to democracy. One is that the rich have more gain power relative to the rest of citizens. A second is that um, they tend to come to have a distinct set of interests relative to those citizens. Um, and sir, third, um, they become more fearful of democracy because democracy they come to see more and more as a threat to their privileges and power. And, um, and this is a longstanding uh, uh, concern of democratic theorists and, uh, and it's something that scholars of democracy have written about quite a bit. But I think it's important to understand that this is something that happens across, rich de uh, across democracies. And indeed, we can see it at the dawn of democracy. So here's just a couple illustrations of the way in which each of these things have played out. So, the wealthy have uh, gained power in, in, in a lot of ways. And I think 
one of them, probably not the most important one, is that they're just a lot more important in the funding of politics. So the, the top 0.101% of donors now account for about half of all campaign finance contributions. And of course, we've seen a massive increase in campaign finance as well. Um, and um, the, um, this plays out in, in a numerous ways, but I think it's really important to understand that the top 0.01%, they're on both sides of the political spectrum, but not equally so, right? So if you look at the very rich, they lean right. Um, and you can see that play out in a lot of areas. This is, a, there's a study of the wealthiest 100s political activities. Someone just recently did a nice study of Fortune 1500 CEOs, thousands of CEOs. And you can look here and just see that most of the money uh, and certainly most of the activity is on the right. Um, and, um, and you can also see it in this figure that we have in the book that I, I, I think is really important because it both shows this difference in the, uh, the, the stance of, of donors, particularly wealthy donors within the Republican Party, um, and the degree to which they're, they're not just at odds with the general public, but with uh, Republican voters. So the only group that gave both the Bush, uh, extension of the Bush tax cuts uh, to, all, to the richest Americans and, the, and Paul Ryan's uh, famous or infamous budget of cutting taxes and cutting benefits for ordinary Americans, the only group that gave a majority support to both those policies are Republican donors with incomes in excess of $250,000 a year. These are like two central centerpieces of Republican policy up to the Trump victory. And remember, Paul Ryan was Speaker of the House um, and he ran uh, as the vice presidential nominee in 2012. And his budget was the official kind of GOP policy. Um, if, 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 um, if Biden can say, I am the Democratic Party, certainly Paul Ryan can say, I am the, I could have said, I am the Republican Party's fiscal, fiscal uh, policy. Um, okay. So the, um, the, the point I want to make is that the Republican Party uh, has a lot of influence. The people within the Republican Party who have a lot of influence are, uh, are these conservative um, uh, affluent voters. And so the, um, the, the place we turn for guidance is this um, work that's done by a number of his, uh, political scientists, but most notably Daniel Zeblatt on how conservative parties adapted in the early 20th century. And the, what we take out of this work is that conservative parties always face this challenge of figuring out how to, um, how to marry, um, how to stay true to their traditional economic patrons and to gain the support of, uh, of ordinary citizens. And so in the early 20th century, this challenge came out about because the suffrage was being expanded. Today, um, in the last 25 years, Republicans, the Conservative Party in the US has faced it because um, we've seen inequality rise so much. And so there's basically two issues, right? How do you get voters um, and, uh, and, and how do you do that in a way that doesn't, uh, that, that, does, that, that allows you to maintain the support of your traditional economic patrons? And there basically are two focuses, right? Two, two possibilities. One, you can moderate on economics. Um, and you see that with the Tories, uh, for, for example, in Britain. But the, the other thing is you need to kind of introduce another set of issues. You can't just focus on, um, on issues of class where you're, um, you're going to lose the majority of voters if you're defending the super rich. And so this is sometimes by political scientists called second dimension issues, but we call them often um, uh, wedge issues, uh, we citizens. And you can see why this becomes important for the Republican Party in particular by looking at this figure. And um, this, is, um, this is showing you the um, votes in 2016. Uh, it's based on a large scale survey. So these are actual voters. Um, and the blue dots, as you might expect, are Democratic voters and the red dots are Republican voters. And there are two axes, right? The up down axis is the so-called uh, sorry, the left-right axis is the kind of right-left division among voters. And the up-down 
is a social identity dimension. It's based mostly on race, uh, immigration, and religiosity. And so it's basically the, the right-wing populist dimension. So you can see if you are both uh, progressive on economics and multiracial tolerant on, uh, on social identity, you're gonna end up in this bottom left quadrant and you're gonna vote democratic. And conversely, if you're in the top right quadrant, you're conservative both on the social identity dimension and on the economic dimension, you, you vote Republican. But, what a, but neither of these is gonna give you a majority of the electorate. Now, if you're Republican, you might think, well, I can get those, um, those libertarians, right? Who are economically conservative, but, um, but are um, liberal on, um, on issues of identity. Um, the problem is that's a tiny group, <laughs> as you might guess. Um, and a lot of them end up voting, as you can see with these little yellow dots, end up voting for third parties because they don't like Donald Trump. The group you need to get is this top left. And that's the group that uh, Donald Trump got. And the way you do that, of course, is by using issues of race. Obviously, you can also moderate on economics, and I do think Trump did as well. And so Gail's right that the Civil Rights Act was a critical moment in the development of, of this kind of racial, the strategy of tapping into racial resentment. However, it's important to understand that when, and we talk about this in the book, that it's not until the 1990s that Republicans really have to double down on this kind of racial resentment um, to, uh, to try to, um, to, uh, to, to offset the degree to which they're pursuing more and more conservative economic policies. So we talk about Nixon, who actually combines a kind of themes of, of, of white backlash and um, working with working class populism, right? He actually is big supporter of labor unions. He massively expands social security. So the point is that as Republicans become more and more focused on that uh, concert, on a set of plutocratic economic policies, they have to um, emphasize more and more themes of racial division. And um, hence, they use white identity to defend wealth inequality. So I said that there are um, two sets of groups, uh, groups with troops. Um, uh, there, there are two sets of groups. One set of groups is these plutocrats, and another set is these groups um, that are mobilizing voters with outrage, groups with troops. And I mentioned the NRA and the Christian right, and it's important to understand these groups have really deep roots in communities and therefore have the capacity to be able to bring voters to the polls in a way that parties often cannot. Um, but it's also the case that as Republicans come to rely more and more on these groups, um, they also are kind of opening a Pandora's box, as we put it in the book. Um, it's hard to close that. <laughs> That's the whole idea of Pandora's box, right? Once you open it, it's hard to close it. So Boehner's chief of staff, for example, speaking about right-wing media says, we fed the beast that ate us, right? Um, so the, the establishment party isn't at war with the right-wing populace, um, because it's getting a lot of stuff at once, but it's also losing control. Um, and, um, and so let me just mention uh, one, a couple of these groups before I talk a little bit about where we might be going. Okay, Fox. Um, Right-wing media is super important, far more important than I think we thought. If there are two things that we kind of do in this book that we didn't do in our prior work is we, we really unpack these groups and we really come to see that race is much more central to the story than we had thought in the past. And Fox is kind of playing this crucial role. It's like a social movement organizer for profit. Um, so with the Tea Party, for example, it's sort of, it's not just um, reporting on these Tea Party protests, it's helping gin them up. And Fox does two things. One is it, because Republicans rely overwhelmingly on Fox, it's able to create a kind of closed epistemic, clo epistemic closure where Republicans are in their own little ecosystem. Secondly, and I think this is, um, this is really important, it's able to use race in a way that politicians, at least until recently, have found very difficult. It's highly racialized, the themes in Fox News on immigration uh, in particular, but also with black-white conflict and um, there's some very suggestive evidence. For example, um, Fox News viewership correlates very highly with uh, racist Google searches, like people looking for the N-word, for example. Um, and, um, and so Fox plays this crucial role because 
it essentially is 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 stoking the same this outrage and becoming this crucial conduit um, for this kind of new strategy. And and the, the Fox is crucial, for example, to the continuing escalation of uh, turnout among white evangelicals who are a declining share of the population, but a very stable share of the electorate. It becomes it is a very important part of making guns a central part as the NRA is mobilizing. Republicans come to see guns, gun ownership and protecting gun ownership as much, much more important. I think it's really striking how close Republicans and Democrats are on the centrality of gun ownership in 2000. By 2020 or so, 2018 or so, right, uh, Republicans are overwhelmingly um, in, uh, of the view that gun ownership is fundamental. Or just look at the covers of the NRA trade magazine, uh, The American Rifleman, right? The early pictures, right, are these pictures that really convey a kind of uh, pro-hunting um, traditional organization. By the time you get to the bottom, right, you're talking about an extreme organization, right, uh, that is um, that is helping uh, create the kind of climate in which this set of 2018 ads uh, become the way in which Republicans uh, are mobilizing their voters. Um, well, I don't know. I don't have those ads. They're not. They're not running. Um, but that's fine. Um, Okay, so let me close with uh, some thoughts about the future. One, one thing I wanna really say is that this is not a majoritarian strategy. I've already said that. Um, and increasingly it relies on sort of bugs and distortions in the American political system that advantage rural areas. And Republicans, um, and, and so in, as Republicans are, are digging deeper and deeper into the well of white voters, they're alienating non-white voters and our country is transforming. So they're on the wrong side of like the two great transformations of our era, rising inequality and growing racial diversity. And so how do they respond? Well, they've basically responded by uh, relying more and more on sort of counter-majoritarian features of our political system. One that's quite obvious is the Supreme Court, right? Um, I think it's pretty striking to see that of the, the court uh, majority, uh, conservative majority, and let's say Barrett gets on the court, which seems almost a certain, then you will have seen six of the, six of the Supreme Court's justices, the six, majority, the six Republicans appointees on the court, uh, all but two of them will have been both, uh, both nominated by a president who won a minority of the popular vote, yet got in because of the electoral college, and uh, have been supported uh, by, by Republicans uh, in, this, in the Senate representing a minority of the American population, right? Because of the Senate's bias towards low population states. Um, and by the way, the fun, the, we're already seeing the centrality of this. It's not just you know, Trump saying that he wants the election, uh, he wants to have the, courts, uh, the court have a conservative majority to deal with the election, lower courts right now are making it very hard to deal with some of the issues that are arising with our pandemic election. Um, so I worry a great deal about where, <laughs> about the future. And by the way, if you just look, it's not just that the gerrymandered House and the small state bias Senate are skewed towards Republicans. Um, they're also skewed towards white people, right? Um, and so you're seeing this, um, these longstanding features of our system become more consequential as the Republicans become a more rural party as they basically have also become much more aggressive in using whatever majority, whatever power they can gain to try to magnify the influence of their voters. We see this at the state level in particular, and um, I'll just skip the electoral college, you know that story, um, but I will come back to it if you're interested. Um, but you see this at the state level, Wisconsin being a kind of clear example. And I think what's most worrisome about this is this sense that like this, this rhetoric about it that is almost of the view that it is, um, that, that, that somehow it's um, un, un it is undemocratic um, to have popular rule, right? So this quote from the Wisconsin assembly speaker essentially is articulating a theory that I, as far as I can tell, it's like one person, one vote, except if that person lives in a city, right? And it's, so it's a kind of extreme, you've seen a kind of extreme, um, the ends justify the means thinking about democracy. And, and, and so 
that that is, I think, the biggest fear that you could have is that you know not only do we face a kind of authoritarian threat, even if Donald Trump is defeated, we still face this kind of counter majoritarian threat where Republicans are willing to exploit political institutions that um, and to stay in power um, in a way that is really uh, undemocratic, small d democratic. So I want to end with my. Uh, a, a relatively optimistic take, and I, and I, I know that seems strange after all I've said, but Paul and I are, are we're, we're kind of half full, glass half full people, but let me start with the half empty. Um, Republicans are, have just proved to be much better at using the power they have to magnify their influence. There's a great little piece by Jerry Taylor, who ran the American Legislative Exchange Council, Alex, and was the head of the Cato Institute, a libertarian think tank, basically saying like Repu Democrats just don't, they don't play hardball. Um, and I do think there is some truth to that. And I think it to some extent goes back um, to uh, Patricia's question about, um, about the way in which Democrats are cross pressured, not just because of money, but because they have to compete uh, in much more conservative areas given the rural bias of our political institutions. But I think, I th I think that's, Obviously, one big problem and the other problem is that Republicans have an entrenched power due to these biases in our political institutions. And so they have used this, right, this, this, their plutocratic populism, right, to both pursue policies for the super rich and corporations that aren't popular and um, to try to entrench the power of, um, of a kind of electoral strategy based on white backlash. Um, that depends a lot on magnifying the influence of a minority of voters. Uh, and the places where that happens are the Senate, which um, has been willing to cede an enormous amount of power to the president when um, the president shares a party label, and the courts. Um, and this was driven home to me, you know, Senator Mike Lee a few years ago had this thing called the Article One Project, which was about how Congress had given up too much of its power. We haven't heard much about that lately. No, instead, Mike Lee is tweeting about how we're not a democracy, we're a republic. Um, we in the book show that, in fact, the founders used the term republic to describe what we call represent, what we now call representative democracy. Um, and indeed, to even call, you know, <laughs> the idea that you know we should have you know roughly proportional representation and majority rule as um, as rank democracy. Um, rank democracy, I guess, is defined as democracy in which Republicans aren't guaranteed to win. Um, but ultimately, I do think we should be optimistic, and and here's why. One is that as we're seeing, right, this is a not a viable long-term strategy. And um, one way to think about this is that it's uh, Republicans are going to have to uh, become a multiracial party and and probably have to moderate on economics if they uh, if they want to be getting a popular majority. That's just a question of math. Um, the question of politics is whether we can hold to whether or not they will seek to moderate or whether they'll try to undermine the free and free and fair elections. And that's so I think I think if we can get through <laughs> this election um, and, hold, and, and seek to political reforms, then we're likely to, to see um, a kind of powerful um, self-reinforcing process that is going to uh, hopefully bring the party uh, back to a more moderate place or create a new party altogether. And I agree completely with, uh, with Gail that, that there are a bunch of institutional reforms we should talk about. However, um, I also want to note um, that, geo that the extremism of the party um, is um, creates some opportunities, right? It's actually possible now, thanks to the Republican tax cuts of 2017, to raise taxes on the rich and raise a ton of money for positive things um, in a way that's entirely popular, right? So that's, you know, and I also think Republicans have painted themselves into a corner on a bunch of issues surrounding racial, uh, racial justice too. So I'm not suggesting there aren't tensions within the Democratic Party, nor that there isn't um, a serious problem of uh, and risk of electoral violence and a share of a substantial share of American voters, though far from a majority, uh, who are not rec at all reconciled to the changes taking place in our society. But but I am suggesting that democracy work 
could be made to work better with uh, political reforms we can talk about, and that if it is, that there's going to be strong electoral pressure for the Republican Party uh, to, to moderate, and the conservative dilemma uh, might lessen. Great, thank you so much. <laughs> You can't hear the clap because we're all on mutes, but <laughs> you can. Yeah, we can do the old uh, clap. But I shouldn't <laughs> apl applaud myself. There's something very uh, self-indulgent about that. But anyway, thank you. It was a pleasure. Great. Let's um, let's do the Q and A. Yeah. Can you say a word about Shelby V. Hall? Sure. Yeah. So for those who don't know, this is a 2013 case that um, got rid of. Um, the a core component of the Voting Rights Act. So in the, under the Voting Rights Act, there was this um, uh, set of policies that developed known as preclearance. And essentially all the states that were um, governed by preclearance were um, uh, uh, Southern states, though Alaska was also included. They were all re uh, Republican states, as it, as it turned out. They all became Republican states. Um, and the idea of preclearance was that um, electoral maps that were drawn up by state uh, by the state government had to be pre-cleared by the Justice Department um, to ensure that they um, ab abided by the Voting Rights Act. And um, there's a lot of political science research um, showing that it actually had a big impact. Um, and so in 2013, um, uh, the, 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 the Supreme Court got rid of pre-clearance. And as we write in the book, immediately um, Republican legislators moved uh, to um, pursue um, restrictive, uh, both ex much more extreme partisan gerrymandering and much more restrictive kinds of voting laws. Um, and, and there's just no question that, um, that this erosion of the Voting Rights Act has um, added to the impetus um, in states that Republicans are controlling. Um, yeah, exactly, Judy. Um, uh, the, it has added to the impetus in, in states Republicans have where uni, states where Republicans have unified control to use some of these um, various measures for uh, suppressing um, voters and uh, and the, there's just also no question that overwhelmingly the the voters who are adversely impacted are low income and non-white voters. Um, there there's been some research on this question of how big of an impact it's had. And I think one of the mistakes people have make in this work is to focus just on one part of it. So do, does voter ID have an impact? And the answer is um, maybe, but it may not be that big um, of that one thing, partly because you see counter mobilization in the short term. But when you start to look across states and just think about like um, the whole range of policies that are pursued, the states that have the most restrictive voter laws have the lowest levels of turnout and the most skewed turnout towards whiter, more affluent voters. I, and they tend to be also states in which there's a significant partisan edge. And we don't need to like, um, we don't need to guess at this. Um, there's a story we tell in the book about the, um, the effort to try to include a question about um, uh, citizenship in the in the census. Now, right now, as you may know, the the Trump administration is trying to use uh, to 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 um, change the census count um, so that they exclude um, uh, uh, people who are who are uh, living in the United States who didn't who are not U.S. citizens. Um, and this is a range of people. It's not just what you you might call illegal immigrants or undocumented immigrants. It's also people who are visiting here or working here with visas, but they're not citizens. Now, the reason they want to do that is pretty obvious, right? And it's at odds with what the Constitution says, but the reason they want to do that is because that would reduce the voting clout and, um, and as well as the distribution of federal funds to areas with large numbers of, of, of um, non-citizens living there, and, and particularly immigrants. And um, and they had tried, uh, Wilbur Ross, the head of the Commerce Department, had tried to include a citizenship question in the census. And, um, and people forget this, that's because we forget everything that happened more than a, like a day ago. But, um, but the reason they did that was because the father of all this kind of voter suppression and, and partisan gerrymandering, this uh, Republican operative named Hoffeller, um, had written a memo in, res uh, in response, regarding a Texas case 
um, uh, Texas redistricting, in which he'd said basically we could get a lot more um, seats if we could um, find out how many uh, immigrants there are, undocumented people there are in, the, in these districts and redraw districts based on, on citizenship. And he said, the problem is we don't know. We need a question for that. He died, the reason we know this is he died and his daughter gave his hard drive, um, which has all this dirty stuff on it. And it turns out he was also funded by this multi-billionaire um, who runs the Washington Free Beacon. So like all the pieces of the story we're telling kind of come together in this one story. So the, you might say, well, thank goodness the Supreme Court did step in and say no. Well, but what they said was basically that, that Wilbur Ross was lying to the Census Department, not that there wasn't, it wasn't constitutional to include this question. And, it's, and, it, and with a 6-3 majority, it's not at all clear that they will say to the Trump administration, and God knows what the Trump administration is going to try to do, um, and it can do it in the lame duck session, even if Trump loses. Um, but, um, but they said, you know, you didn't do, you, you know, you didn't follow the rules and the Trump administration may try to f pursue this. So it's like, it's really just like with the preclearance question, we're in this period in which nothing seems to be off the table that was uh, off the table in a previous era. And it seems to be a big part of the story is that those who have great amounts of influence and wealth, um, at the very least, are not fighting this aggressively and sometimes are actually um, pursuing it because they would like to keep Republicans in power. Can you say a word about how the Republicans have leveraged the abortion issue? Yeah. So the, this, we have a chapter, first of all, I really encourage people to pick up the book um, and, you know, just because I think there's a lot that's of value in there. Um, but we have a chapter that's on these um, groups, um, these surrogate groups, and it's entitled Organizing Through Outrage. And the Christian right, which I didn't really talk much about, is a real, it's a fascinating story because um, conservative Christians, evangelical Christians mobilized, particularly in the South, in, uh, after the civil rights um, breakthroughs, um, to protect uh, this new set of um, educational institutions, private segregated academies, um, that had arisen and they feared would be um, ruled unconstitutional by the Supreme Court. They did not arise around abortion. In fact, um, Roe v. Wade was not an issue at all among evangelicals um, initially. Um, in fact, a number of the conservative Christian groups took, were neutral on it um, in well into the, to the late 70s. The, there was a, uh, this changed with a set of conservative Catholic organizers, uh, Paul Weirich in particular, who were trying to bring uh, evangelicals into the Republican fold. And they, they initially couldn't get much in the way of traction among Republic, uh, evangelical leaders. And part of the problem was that evangelical leaders really were focused not just on the segregated academies, but on prayer and school. And that was not an issue that was going to unite conservative Christian groups. For example, Catholics would be very fearful, right, of a Protestant hegemony. hegemony. And so what the Weirich did, they basically used abortion as a kind of key issue in, in fighting Roe v. Wade. And then it becomes really core to the GOP um, platforms and to the Republican organizing efforts. And I'm not suggesting that people aren't sincere in their anti-abortion views. I'm just, it's very interesting to see how it gets built into, it becomes um, a core part of the organizing because it it's, serves this central purpose, right, of uniting conservative Catholics and evangelicals, and also of allowing the courts to be the central focus. And um, yes, it's a great book. And then Francis uh, Fitzgerald's uh, Evangelicals is excellent too. Um, and this sort of is, so one thing that we talk about is the Republicans are trying to bring these groups in. And again and again, they're trying to find groups that have two qualities. One, they have a lot of capacity to mobilize people, right? And it doesn't have to be a majority. In fact, it can't be a majority because there's just no way you could bring groups in on these kind of really extreme positions, a majority of Americans. Um, so they have to have that group, they have to have the groups of tr troops quality, but they also can't challenge plutocracy. <laughs> and so, Early on, some of the evangelical Christian groups are like, well, we need to have a lunch, you know, a, a bread and butter uh, agenda as well. Evangelicals on average are less affluent members of the GOP coalition. And 
uh, Republicans are really insistent on bringing them in on terms that don't challenge um, the kind of growing commitment of the party to tax cuts for the rich and deregulation. And, and, and abortion is a great issue. And in fact, the courts become like the central focus. Why? Because you can pursue minoritarian goals through the courts and the, the, the Koch brothers network, <laughs> the Koch network and the conservative Christian network, they, they can cooperate on the courts, right? You can get pro-business justices who are also anti-abortion, socially conservative. And the embodiment of this is the Federal Society's um, uh, efforts, the Judicial Crisis Network, Le Leonard Leo, for example, a conservative Catholic. He's, he's very, very keen on the social conservative issues, but the money comes from the Koch network and from other uh, conservative billionaires. Um, and just to give you an illustration of this, as Kavanaugh was being considered, again, 44% of the senators representing 44% of Americans got Kavanaugh through, right? So skin of the teeth. And there was, the, it was crucial that the Judicial Crisis Network was able to spend um, tens of millions of dollars in, in, in to push him through. Six, as they were, as Kavanaugh's uh, was becoming more and more endangered, a single donation of $16 million came into the Judicial Crisis Network. So that is definitely not coming from some conservative Christian voter, right? <laughs> so that's a, that's a really important part that abortion tells us a story about how plutocratic populism works and the courts are really where it works best, which helps explain why getting Barrett through is the number one priority of the Republican Party. Um, in the run-up to the election, as opposed to like, you know, passing something to help Americans that would be popular and would help uh, Republicans win re-election through doing good. If there are more questions, then uh, write them in the chat and we'll try to capture them, answer them. So uh, could you say a word about China? Do you see that as a fundamentally economic struggle or is it feeding a racial uh, trope that that Trump wants to uh, e exacerbate. I think it's obviously both. Actually, um, let me share the screen because I want to tell two stories. So on China, um, there. So I think we talk about this in the book. So the the anti-immigrant stuff is not really very economic. Right. So because you might think that it's about, you know, working class voters who feel threatened by low wage immigrant labor uh, or it could be it could be that it has something to do with um, with the, indus the different industries within the, the Republican coalition and how they feel uh, how some of them are 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 competing with industries that are relying on low wage immigrant labor. None of that is true. It's almost 100 percent about um, about this idea of, of, of America being uh, you know, a, a, a white Christian nation and the kind of invasion of um, the country by uh, foreign forces. So the trade policy stuff is closer to a kind of economic policy issue, but I think you're absolutely right that a big, big part of it, and certainly it's been true since the coronavirus, has been about using China as a kind of, um, as a kind of racial threat as well. Um, and, and, you know, what we say in the book is that racial threat is so powerful because people are motive, people are much more easily motivated by sort of tribal issues and fear. And um, that we quote and discuss a lot of the psychological research on this. Um, and indeed, everyone who's involved with Republican politics acknowledges this, right? They talk about how this is the motivator that they use. There's a great moment in 2000. 17, not great, but revealing moment in 2017, where essentially it becomes clear that the fiscal issues are complete losers, right? The tax cuts, which they try to run on early on, just have no traction whatsoever. And so all the donors, the rich donors, right, are like, don't talk about the tax cuts. Don't talk about, um, you know, uh, fiscal restraint. Talk about immigration, right? Talk about red meat social issues. Um, and of course, that's what they did in the, in the run up to 2018. So. But I think there is a story here about China that is also about trade. And this is the one, this I would say is one area where it's quite clear that Republican, that white working class voters uh, in areas adversely affected by the, the, the deindustrialization were have become highly receptive to Republican appeals. And part of that was that Democrats cross pressured by money 
um, focused a lot on their urban constituency, didn't do enough to try to appeal to these voters. And so let me show you a slide that I think um, really is revealing of the way in which race, racism builds on, um, uh, builds on economics. And that these are, two things are not wholly separate. So this is gonna look a little complex, um, but I'll explain it. So David Autor and his colleagues have done a series of studies where they've looked at the so-called China shock. Um, and this is basically, the reason that they're doing this is because they want something that's kind of exogenous, right? So the China shock is basically some types of manufacturing were highly vulnerable because of Chinese imports. And the, they looked at um, areas that have been adversely affected by this shock. And so these are places that have been economically devastated. And, um, and what's really telling here is this red bands are the conservative Republicans. And when the China shock occurs, right, areas that are essentially white, you see moderate Republicans or Democrats get destroyed and conservative Republicans take power. Now, it turns out that in areas that were really diverse that experienced the China shock, and there are not many of them, that actually liberal Democrats uh, did better. But so, so how do you explain this? It's not, it can't just be racism, right? Racism is a key part of it, right? But the racism is there, but it's the economic dislocations that are, um, that are giving rise to this incentive for Republicans to mo mobilize these folks um, and to mobilize them not on economic issues because that would be inconsistent with plutocracy, but to mobilize them with race. So I hope that helps think a little bit about the role of China. Um, so we've got a bunch of questions in the chat that I feel like I could take. Um, so let me just say a little bit, um, yeah, um, let me talk a little bit about the sort of set of institutional reforms that are on the table. Um, and then um, there's also this, this question of, uh, uh, um, that I think is a really good one about what about the prospects for civil violence, the role of the militias. As an Oregonian, watching what has been playing out in, my, in Portland where my parents live has been really painful. Um, okay, so there are basically three big reforms on the table right now. Um, and, and to extent that's not been true in my lifetime, right, we are talking about political reform and reform of kind of fundamental features of our political system. Um, so one, the, the ones that seem most plot, the one that seems most plausible to me is that you're going to see uh, the elimination of the filibuster in the Senate. Um, and the filibuster, and, and that's in, for two reasons, right? One is the filibuster is a pretty, is really easy to change, right? A majority of senators could change it. If the Republicans, if Democrats have a majority in the Senate that is, um, that is not big enough to pass laws with, um, with overcome a Republican filibuster, which is, is going to be the case if they have a majority, they would need 60 votes to under, overcome a filibuster. So if they, it, they, they're not going to be able to achieve a lot of their goals without getting rid of the filibuster. And remember, the filibuster has been changed. It, it, it is not a feature of the Constitution. It's a set of Senate rules. It's been changed repeatedly, particularly in recent years. It's no longer, uh, there's no, Mitch McConnell got rid of it for Supreme Court justices. Uh, Harry Reid got rid of it for, look, for, for lower court appointments and for political, uh, for, for, for presidential appointments. Um, and it's not active on the budget, so it creates all this incentive to put everything into the budget. Um, and I, I, you know, I think we should have incentives for longer deliberation in the Senate than in the House, but I don't see any reason it shouldn't be a majoritarian body, especially given with the skew of the Senate towards low population states and thus to the Republican Party. Right now, senators representing one-tenth of the population can sustain a filibuster, right? That just makes no sense. Um, so the filibuster seems most likely, and if they get rid of the filibuster, they can do a lot of other things. But I don't know if they will. Um, if they have a very narrow majority, then um, there, it only takes one or two holdouts. And there are a bunch of uh, Democrats who um, have benefited from their ability to be pivotal because of the filibuster. You know, senators like Dianne Feinstein. So we'll see. But uh, that's kind of a very first test of whether they Republican Democrats could play a little more hardball because this is this is the softest of the hardballs. 
The second thing, um, the second thing has to do with kind of broader political reform, making voting easier, um, maybe adding DC and Puerto Rico as states, which would slightly reduce the skew of the Senate towards uh, low popular towards the uh, Republicans, but also would be the right thing to do, particularly with regard to Puerto Rico. Um, so we'll see on that. Um, uh, with other political reforms, the voting rights stuff would be really important and great. Um, and, and again, both those things are, are, don't require kind of revisiting the Constitution, but they require an exercise of power. Um, and and it, they require putting these things up as a priority. Then there's a bunch of things that are actually challenging. Uh, and probably the Supreme Court um, is the number one of those third set of uh, reforms. And there are basically a bunch of ideas for how to deal with the Supreme Court. The challenge here, I think, is the Democrats are much more fractured uh, on this question. Um, and, um, and they're much, um, and there's uh, much less sort of, um, the, the, the precedent in terms of FDR's failure to court pack and the fact that there is a sort of public and, and, uh, ambivalence about it, it, it could be problematic. Uh, it strikes me as the hardest of the things. But it's worth noting that if Democrats at least don't try to do something with the Supreme Court, right, that they're going to have really let the other side basically redefine um, the norms and the playing field. So, and, you know, people say, well, FDR lost, but FDR actually scared the Supreme Court witless. And, um, and so they, upheld the uh, New Deal. And uh, there's a famous, you know, famous saying about that with the switch in time that saved nine, because had they not upheld the New Deal, if they'd struck down the Social Security Act, for example, they almost certainly would have faced um, the kind of um, institutional reforms that are being considered today. So that's, that's my take on the, um, on the, on that situation. Um, so I don't think we can underestimate how much of a barrier the Supreme Court will be. I think, um, uh, Norcott, Norcott Pemberton's iPad is very wise. Nor, Norcott might be wise too. Um, uh, I'm going to go back up. Um, so the other thing is, I, I agree with, um, with Bill that actually the Supreme Court gets way too much attention. I, I don't know if you guys saw that figure I had uh, earlier, maybe I, um, uh, but, but the lower courts are really where a lot of the action is. And the lower courts have been changed quite a bit. Like Carter, you know, changed the lower courts quite substantially. Nobody cares, right? And I mean, you might say nobody cares about anything Carter did. But in this case, nobody really people don't remember that. But it was quite an important change in, in the lower courts. Um, militias. I said I would say a word about that. Um, and, you know, I was just listening to the story um, about since I'm from Oregon originally, I, I used to be a race bikes and travel all over the area. And I spent a lot of time in Idaho um, uh, around Coeur d'Alene and elsewhere, um, often just passing through on the way to like Spokane. But um, the, the story was really about what's happened in Idaho. And you probably know, Idaho, you know, uh, uh, white supremacist groups identified it as a potential site for uh, kind of creating a new utopia for, for white identity um, uh, politics. But, but what was really striking to me was that every town hall meeting in Coeur d'Alene, there's a bunch of guys with guns. Um, and, you know, if you look at these images, um, thankfully we live in a place where that's not so much happening. But if you look at these images, right, there's just this, this acceptance in the US and in particular parts of the US of the idea that, um, that, that brandishing, you know, you know, uh, <laughs> brandishing uh, semi-automatic and automatic weaponry is like a completely important, uh, valid part of, of political debate. And, and I, I think it's really a big issue and a big concern. And there's a, there's a bunch of, um, uh, thinking taking place among uh, sort of citizen leaders about how we might deal with this. Um, because I think you're absolutely right. Um, Norcott Pemberton, Pemberton's iPad is absolutely right that it's going to be really hard to change the laws fundamentally here. However, I will note that, that a lot of this is, uh, is law that could be, that could, that under current jurisprudence, the that uh, could be altered, like uh, concealed carry laws, for example, just, uh, have been so far at least not treated as like essential to the Second Amendment. But 
but I, but I feel like, I mean, one of the things that has been so scary to me over the last few years is the extent to which there's been a kind of it's both sides um, reporting, even among even in, you know, in, in mainstream journalism, that somehow there's this bunch of left wing radicals with guns running around fighting right wing radicals with guns when the FBI and uh, has said that 90, 90 to 95 percent of the domestic terrorist threat is due to um, is due to right wing groups. So. Uh, hopefully, if there is a shift in politics, uh, there will also be a shift in policy. But I do think that in the near term, we could really face some significant uh, acts of civil violence. And uh, we should all be really vigilant about that. And um, campaign finance reform. Um, yeah. Judy's right. Um, There are maybe I'm not a, a constitutional law expert, but I, I don't think it's quite as clean as that, Judy. But um, I'd be I'd be interested in reading more about it. But um, th it's not as if they can somehow like wall off all their their legislative uh, uh, law from constitutional challenge. But it's certainly the case that um, that the courts um, that there are a lot of strategies that Congress could pursue. And, and the courts have taken this, have said this again and again. Um, you know, they say, well, we're going to get rid of this Voting Rights Act provision, but Congress can pass, you know, it's perfectly free to pass a new um, form of preclearance, which will pass, we, we hope will pass constitutional muster. And so a big thing has been Mitch McConnell's capacity to squash any kind of reconsideration of this. And so the it is the case that if Democrats, and this is why I think getting rid of the filibuster is so important, if Democrats are in a position where they can legislate, right, it will be possible to revisit some of these things that the court has struck down, um, where they've said there are viable paths forward. Now, with a 6-3 majority, maybe there won't be, or that it'll be a lot harder to find. But it's the fact that we've not been able to legislate that's been a really big part of it. And just having the House, we've learned that you know, the House was, was, James Madison said, the House is the repository of the democratic principles of government. Um, but it turns out, right, now the House is the kind of least dangerous branch of U.S. government. It's completely impotent um, if, if the Senate is uh, hostile to it and if the senators are willing to defer to the courts and to the executive. And so um, restoring Article one, I like a true Article one project would be really important and would help in terms of dealing with the courts. So yeah, you could strengthen congressional subpoena power, but it's worth noting the Supreme Court has just stepped in to make that harder. Uh, campaign finance reform. The court, like asking what the court will support is difficult because we know Barrett's gonna be super conservative, right? There's no question about that. She's the most conservative member of the Seventh Circuit. Um, bar bar none. Well, I guess that's the most conservative member. Um, her answers suggest that she not she wouldn't necessarily uphold the EPA's power to regulate carbon emissions. Um, that she considers Medicare not to be. I mean, sorry, the, the 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 various Supreme Court rulings upholding Medicare and Social Security as constitutional not to be settled law, not to be super precedent. In fact. The only thing that she said was super precedent was Brown v. Board of Education. Um, so we can take um, some comfort in the idea that uh, de, uh, de jure segregation is, is not going to be accepted by the Supreme Court. But basically, everything else seems to be on the table. So will the Supreme Court support campaign finance reform? Who knows? But if you are asking, um, was there a path for campaign finance reform prior to Amy Coney Barrett, the answer is yes, right? Uh, the court has said that these matching programs are constitutional. I think it's probably though, makes it less viable to pursue campaign finance reform and more important to pursue something that is surely constitutional, which is uh, uh, shifting to encourage greater voter power, right? Um, through reform of electoral processes. Let me stop there um, because I'm not actually sure how much more time we have, Dan, and also because there may be some questions that aren't in the chat. Yeah, I think we're doing okay on time. Um, if we'll, we'll throw it out for a last, last appeal for the chat questions. Um, while that's going on, while you're furiously typing, I should mention this evening on the United States of Anxiety on NPR,
there is a segment on the Republican Party and how it's evolved in the last several years. And their guest, I can't remember his name, but their guest is a conservative commentator or strategist. So Steve Schmidt, maybe? Schmidt? Could be. Oh, anyway, go, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so. Um, so it looks like. Um, the yeah, this, this country has definitely not addressed domestic uh, terrorism, Gail's iPhone. Um, <laughs> um, keep going with questions, but let me ask this backlash, the 1619 project and curriculum. I mean, that's nothing new, not the backlash. Actually, this is kind of, I mean, it's kind of, ex it's a kind of striking to me that this has become like a, a core, this kind of idea that um, acknowledging the role of slavery in the development of the American, American political institutions and society is, you know, is somehow controversial. Um, but um, but the, the, the curriculum stuff is nothing new. That's the curriculum wars have been taking place at the state level for, for literally for, for, for decades. And certainly um, they've been intensified in the last 20 years. And, um, and I don't see any, like, I don't see a huge prospect of those kinds of state level fights getting less intense in the future, right? So for example, if the Supreme Court does um, rule against Roe, it's gonna shift all of that politics down to the state level. And even if it says, well, we're gonna uphold a kind of core protection here, but let, you know, let all these different restrictions um, on women's right to choose be, be um, in place, that's gonna be a huge set of conflicts. The evidence is very clear that at the state level, that um, that the the Republican Party has pursued a kind of intense plutocratic populism. I have a um, paper with Paul and another co-author called um, "The Political Economies of Red Political Economy of Red States," in which we talk about as the part the states have become more plutocratic, particularly responding to the American Legislative Exchange Council. There's a great book on the role of the American Legislative Exchange Council called State Capture by Alex Hurdle Fernandez. But, but as that's happened, Republican politicians in these states have emphasized, as they have at the national level, more and more these kind of uh, themes of cultural and racial division. Also, they've, of course, resorted more and more to sort of various forms of voter suppression. And so that seems to be likely to continue. What, What's sort of hopeful about the states is what's hopeful at the national level is that you are seeing these shifts. The, part of the problem is that in demographic shifts, but part of the problem is that the, there are all, the states, the demographic shifts are dramatic nationally, but they're concentrated in certain states. So we're seeing Arizona, Texas, Florida, the Carolinas, you're seeing a bunch of places that are shifting dramatically. And you know, that Texas could actually be a, a viable democratic um, uh, state in the, in the future is really striking, right? But they're, they're not, they're the exception, as I showed earlier in that figure, right? That if you look at the median state, or if you look at the battleground states, um, that, uh, because of the way the electoral college is structured, that, um, that the states, uh, that those states still remain really, really white. Yeah, we're working hard on Arizona. Thanks. Um, so on the Electoral College, um, I'm glad you guys brought that up. Um, and I actually have a, this, I have a slide that I want to show um, on that. Let me just pull it up. I may have actually shown it, but I, I actually, I skipped through it really, really quickly, but, um, but I want to show it to you. Okay, so hopefully you can see this figure, which is a little weird, hold on, there we go. Um, so there was a paper the National Bureau of Economic Research recently did that, um, that really showed the, the problem in the Electoral College. Now, it strikes me that the Electoral College has many problems, but one of them is this problem of, um, of what the, the authors of this paper call inversions. And an inversion is when a, one candidate wins the popular vote and the other candidate wins the electoral college. And what this figure shows you is note that the discontinuity at 
that when Republicans get close to 50%, their chance of winning through an inversion uh, goes way, way up. And this is pretty striking. Look, um, take 4951, right? So this is a two point spread here. If Republicans, and the, you can see the on the X axis down at the bottom, that's the share of the Republican share of the normal two party vote. So if Republicans get 49%, they have a quarter, 25% chance of winning through an inversion. If Democrats get 51%, they have almost zero chance, right? So it's highly asymmetric. And the closer you get to 50-50, the, um, the more likely it is to get an inversion. Um, and so this is a really serious problem. This could happen again and again. Um, and it's not just because the electoral college is skewed towards um, low population states um, because of the fact that you get the number of senators plus the number of members of Congress as your number of electoral college votes, but also because of the nature of which states are battleground states because of the winner take all structure of the electoral college. And so it, whatever the reason, it's more, you know, we had one inversion prior to 2000, right? And we, since 2000, right, we've had, um, we've had two inversions and they both favored Republicans. And, and the result is that Republicans have won the popular vote once in 30 years. And they've held the presidency for 12 of those years. And they've appointed six of three Supreme Court justices, right? Or five of three, sorry, um, but six of three soon. So I think that's very striking. So how would you fix it? And, and by the way, I think even if it didn't have this partisan split, it'd still be a really bad idea, right? So one thing is it focuses all the campaigning in the battleground states. And another thing that I think people don't pay as much attention to is because it is actually an electoral college where in principle or in, in theory, the states appoint electors, that you have the possibility of states getting involved that you don't have if you just have a national popular vote. So in 2000, as the Florida battle was taking place, the Florida elect legislator actually voted on a slate of electors for Republicans, right? Saying, we don't, you know, we don't, if the, we, we may not know who's gonna win, but we're gonna make sure that George W. Bush wins. Um, and this is something that could happen in this election as well. Um, if uh, it's really close. So that's one reason that we all have to be really, really focused because there's far more states that um, Republicans control, as you see from this red blue map, um, even though they're, uh, they received a minority of the vote. Um, so the electoral college is bad, um, but you wouldn't have to amend the constitution to fix it as is noted in the questions. Um, you could have um, what's called the national popular vote compact where states representing a majority of the electoral college vote agree that they will give their um, electors, uh, all their electors to the winner of the popular vote. So of course, if you cross that line, um, then you will have um, a, um, you will have essentially a national popular vote. The problem is that's easier than a constitutional amendment, but it still runs into this issue, which is very few people, very few politicians who have unfair advantages in politics, give them up voluntarily. So, um, so I think um, this may be a very important reason why Democrats have to compete nationwide, right? Because you really need to see um, Democrats um, gaining ground in states like Montana or D the Dakotas so that you have the prospect of the kind of institutional reforms that are not possible in the absence of that. And I think Democrats have really have I mean, I don't want to. I don't want to um, end on a down note, but I really do think Democrats have just have um, become somewhat over reliant on their um, their ability to win in urban areas and not um, attentive enough to the ways in which um, they in American politics is not fair. But um, you really have to you have to hold territory as well as win votes, right? So it's more efficient for Democrats to focus on the places where lots of people are. But for winning power over the longer term, they've got to focus on the less populated areas of the country. And that's going to be tough because um, they're, um, the, the, the party has not been as comfortable doing that. So I think we'll leave it there. Professor Jacob Hacker, thank you so much. It's been Thanks, a Dan. Less, less a lecture session. And um, I don't know if everybody realizes it, but it, and, Almost an hour and a half has gone by and we've been spellbound.
So uh, thank you so much, Dan. Thank and you. Um, you can uh, applaud me by uh, picking up a copy of the book, but even more important, and really, this is the most important thing, vote. Um, and, and, and maybe even more important than you voting, because uh, uh, unless you guys are uh, like zooming in from, from outside the state, you are in, uh, not in a battleground state, is to find anybody you know um, who's not, who's, who's in a state that really matters, um, or in a district, if you're talking about Maine, uh, that really matters, uh, and, uh, and, and get them to vote. And, uh, so thank you all for having me. Uh, thanks, Dan, for putting this together. The Blackstone Library is an amazing institution. Let's hope that we can all go back to it in the not too distant future. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.